Hi there, welcome back. Um, so this slide is sort of a summary of what we went through so far and um, giving a timeline of these activities. For incorporation, you're looking at about um, 10 days, as I mentioned. This is um, being conservative, giving adequate time for planning out the incorporation, collecting documents, and then going through the process. Though technically this can be done in as little as a single day because the incorporation itself is now online and Future Books does have a streamlined online incorporation form. The second step, um, if you're a foreign director that you have to go through is updating the Ministry of Manpower with the record of the newly incorporated company. And that can take up to 14 days after your incorporation. And your work visa application is possible after the updation with MOM happens. Now the work visa itself can be as soon as four days, though in recent times what we have seen is with the first application for a new company, the ministry does want to scrutinize the both the company as well as the applicant carefully to understand the nature of business. So what can be expected is that the initial application um, is rejected and more information is asked for through an appeal process. And this appeal process can take up to eight weeks. In terms of opening a bank account, there are two time frames. I mentioned earlier in terms of directors and shareholders living abroad that I talk about it and this is where I'm going to talk about it. So with opening a bank account, if you have a minimum of two company officers, one director and one company secretary present here during the account opening, you can expect a pretty swift opening within seven days usually. But if there are no officers present here at all physically for the opening, it's still technically possible to get the account opened but you're looking at a prolonged 60 day period where um, <clears throat> documents are notarized and couriered through back and forth. Let's go through a few scenarios now which um, cover all of what we spoke about right now. So you're a local entrepreneur, you wanna test out an idea. What's the sort of entity you might go for? I'd say, a sole proprietorship might be one of the friendliest options because you can get it set up right away at a very low cost. For any income that you earn through the sole proprietorship that's reported on your personal income tax. And you do have the option of converting the sole proprietorship into a company later, retaining the same name and also taking over the assets of the sole proprietorship into the company. Um, with the bank account, though, you will have to close your sole proprietorship bank account and open up a separate company bank account. That's the process. Now, if your idea takes off and it's now time to build a payroll, this is where you want to convert your um, sole proprietorship into a private limited company. Or if you're starting off with funding with the need for a payroll, you want to set up a private limited company right away. Key things are choose the right activity and it's important to avoid certain activities like um, investment holding company or financial services company or at least be aware of the implications of these because if you do choose an activity like investment holding company your bank is going to scrutinize that very carefully and a lot of times reject the account opening. And if it's a financial services activity that's chosen, that's going to be looked at by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. The other thing, the next step that you'd follow is informing Ministry of Manpower of your company's incorporation. This is relevant if you're planning to hire foreigners on your payroll. And for the locals on your payroll, commence paying CPF. If you are planning to hire S-Pass holders, you will need to uh, contribute CPF for a minimum of three months before um, you can apply for your S-Pass. And you would need a commercial premise which you can use as your registered address. 
and the taxation that you would be subject to is the company rate of tax and that includes an attractive startup tax exemption of $100,000 in profit for each of the first three years. The only condition is that you have a minimum 10% individual shareholding. In fact, we've covered the corporate tax part of it in quite detail, both in events prior as well as on articles that we have published, and that's something that you can find on the Future Books blog. Now, if you are a foreigner who's currently holding an employment pass and you want to start a business, the steps that you'd follow is incorporate a private limited company, and while you're doing this, choose a paid up capital that's about six times your current salary or the salary you're going to declare for a new employment pass. And that's sort of a thumb rule which defines adequate paid up capital uh, that Ministry of Manpower will consider um, a solid credence for approving your application. The other thing that you'd need to do is first appoint a local director for a quarter so that while your employment pass is being processed, your company has a local director. Now, once your pass is approved by the Ministry of Manpower, you can execute an employment contract between your company and yourself as an executive director. And there's really two taxes that are applicable here. One is a company rate of tax, which is for revenue that the company earns. And the second is your personal income tax, which is for your salary that you're defining from the company, that you're taking from the company. You do have the option of then applying for a permanent residence later, which will give you considerably more flexibility in terms of acting as director for multiple companies. Now, if you are a dependent pass holder and you're choosing to start a business, you can choose to have a sole proprietorship. That's the easiest setup. And then apply for a letter of consent from the Ministry of Manpower. The key difference between a letter of consent and an employment pass is that for a letter of consent, the salary level can be lower. The approval process itself is faster and arguably easier and um, the education documents or the education threshold is not scrutinized as stringently. Now, once you've set up your sole proprietorship and received your LOC, you appoint yourself as a local manager within your sole proprietorship, and you will also be the owner of the sole proprietorship, and any income that you earn through the sole proprietorship is your personal income tax that you report on April 14th every year. You do have the option uh, of converting your sole proprietorship into a private limited later once the activity kicks off further. And at that time, you'll have to transfer your letter of consent from your sole proprietorship over to your private limited company. If you're a foreigner who does not wish to live in Singapore but would like a company here, and this is really pretty common because <clears throat> for a number of reasons, either you could be looking at um, using the banking facilities here that are pretty robust, or you could be setting up an entity to hold IP and later facilitate investment into here. We see a lot of that happening with directors who are living in countries like Indonesia, Philippines, and Thailand who set up a company here to uh, hold their IP and book their revenue because of the stability in legal structure. And in that case, what you'd need is to appoint a nominee director here and appoint a minimum of two directors from your site. This could be a person living anywhere in the world. And we recommend a minimum of two if there's one nominee so that at all times you maintain the majority on the board and control of the company. As a foreigner, you can be the complete shareholder of the company. If you do choose to make your foreign company the shareholder, then you'll have to go through the audit process. If you are from a country that requires an entry visa into Singapore, you do have the option of applying for what's called a business visa from the Immigration and Checkpoints Authority, ICA and your company will be considered a resident of Singapore and pay the company rate of tax here. It's a pretty useful entity for 
those doing business in this region who would like to um, ride on the stability that the Singapore legal entity offers. Well, that's it. Ah, success. Thanks so much for joining us with Future Books and see you the next time.